This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Likeable science, as you well know, is all about how science is a vital and interesting part of all of our lives. It's not something done by, science, by scientists for scientists. It's something done by each of us every day for our own benefit, for the benefit of others. We're going to talk today about a, a, an interesting area that people might not think of as science, but it has a lot of science in it. We're going to talk about bees. And with me today is Darren Olson, a beekeeper. Welcome, Darren. Aloha. Thank you. Nice to see you. Uh, Darren comes by his beekeeping skills honestly and hereditarily, I guess. His, his family has been keeping bees for generations upon generations, large guys back in Norway. Yes. Oh, excellent, excellent. But uh, he has chosen a much more gentle climate to raise the bees in. And um, so uh, you know, we tend to think of bees, a lot of people tend to think of bees as bees, right? But, but there are actually lots of different kinds of bees, right? So can you maybe give us, a, without going into too much detail, because there are really a lot of kinds of bees, but some of the general big groups? So some of the definitions I have to start off with are things like wasps and hornets. Mm -hmm. Things that we think of, of like yellow jackets, bald-faced hornets, paper wasps, those are insects that look like bees to 90% of Americans, but they sting repeatedly. They're mm -hmm. able to inject venom into people a bunch of times mm -hmm. and still live and fly away. That's their defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. Then there's honeybees, the things that most beekeepers care the most about because we get a lot of honey from those bees. Mm -hmm. So those are Italian and Carniolan is the main categories of honeybees that we care about. Okay. Then there's a Hawaiian bee that makes honey. It was brought over to Hawaii about 200-ish years ago and is now only found in Hawaii. Okay. So that bee also makes honey, but at a slower amount over mm -hmm. time and is a lot more aggressive, uh -huh. more likely to sting huh. the beekeeper. <laughs> so you don't like them. <laughs> I, I have to tend them. Uh -huh. That's my kuleana or uh -huh. responsibility uh -huh. to take care of them because we have one slide of me bringing a swarm out from an agriculture park in this case. Uh -huh. And this is the day of when we were catching a swarm. They were in somebody's cupboard. Uh -huh. <laughs> Not what they wanted. They were there by choice because they were out of the rain. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. but they prefer to be in a safe covered area that's a f away from that and here we are catching those swarms of bees so that we can preserve our uniqueness to Hawaii that's mm -hmm. now lost in Europe and in the mainland. So th this Hawaiian honeybee is a separate species of bee now, so really? Like we're calling it a separate species, okay. Okay. but could mate with oh. honeybees, okay. but we prefer not to, sure. because we want the traits to right. be sure. unique. Right, sure. Their venom is very valuable huh. versus the honeybee's venom, which is less valuable. Huh. Okay. And then we have, hopefully, our topic today, <laughs> Hawaiian endemic solitary bees. Mm -hmm. So species of bees that are usually stingless that have been here in Hawaii endemic. Okay. 40 to 50,000 years mm -hmm. of being here in Hawaii. Right. So these are bees that presumably one or two of them showed up, got blown over here by a storm eons and eons ago. Or were with the voyaging right. travelers right. on some means right. and came here as part of the voyaging spirit okay. of their own, okay. <laughs> looking for more prospects of land. Mm -hmm. And so now these bees don't make honey, right? So in general, no. Okay. We categorize them by size. Okay. And these bees are unique and specific. Mm -hmm. Honeybees make 
a lot of honey. Here in Hawaii, a healthy honey beehive can make 300 pounds of honey for a beekeeper to take and remove, mm -hmm. and they still have food left over. Mm -hmm. sure. An endemic yellow-faced Hawaiian bee only eats food and then flies to its next location and has burnt up all the calories that it consumed uh -huh. in its flight to get to its next location okay. and then needs to eat uh -huh. and then has enough energy to fly to its next location. Okay. And so it is dependent on our land here in Hawaii 100% for its food in order to go from place to place. Right. At the same time, the plants that, that, that these bees deal with, some, some of them certainly over evolutionary time spans have become more or less dependent upon these bees, right? So why do you care right. about these endemic, endangered mm -hmm. species of Hawaiian bees? Mm -hmm. For example, orchids that are endemic to Hawaii only pollinate from these specific Hawaiian solitary bees. Right. We'll lose these, for example, 14 species of orchids if these seven endemic Hawaiian bees die off because they're going to be no longer endangered but then become extinct, mm -hmm. then those orchids will also become extinct. Right, because it's a very, the orchids are a very classic case of this sort of co-evolution of, of pollinators and plants, and the plants have evolved to make themselves more attractive to the pollinators, and the pollinators focus more and more narrowly on those plants, and it's led to sort of an evolutionary spiral where they they're, have become mutually dependent. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, so it's, okay, so there's a, there's a very good reason why. So what, in general, what are the big threats to these bees then? So without saying any company's names, <laughs> the agrochemical companies that spray poisons on our land and have decimated land use into a single use item mm -hmm. has stopped these Hawaiian bees from being able to jump from place to place, eat food and then be able to jump to their next place. So their area used to be the island of Oahu and they knew how to find and forage enough food, which there's plenty of food mm -hmm. for all bees here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. We do need more honeybees to sustain our agriculture right. at a better commercial level. Mm -hmm. And I mean food that we normally consider food mm -hmm. <laughs> versus how we have just a commercial industry that is making huge sections of land single use. Right, which are then unsuitable for these bees. For these bees. So the bees get their uh, habitat gets fragmented. And it's right. so large that they can't cross right. over these barriers. Right, so this, this island becomes actually a set of smaller islands for them, and those they're confined to these little smaller, smaller pockets. Yes. Plus, I'd imagine some of the chemicals that are being sprayed there probably aren't the best things for these bees. So that's also destroying them. Mm -hmm. So they're more susceptible when they weren't previously for the past 40,000 years to viruses, for example. Mm -hmm. These chemicals are destroying their nervous system, their brains, mm -hmm. in a way that is making them lose information. Mm -hmm. What they used to do naturally, they're no longer able to do. So what, what do you mean here? Expand on that for yourself? So there's a few chemicals like neonicotinoids. Sure. So this is a chemical that they're spraying on seeds before they get sold to you at Home Depot or Lowe's. Mm -hmm. So then a person buys those seeds not knowing what's on them, mm -hmm. plants them in their garden, mm -hmm. bees, any bees, bumblebees, Hawaiian bees, honeybees, they go and eat from those plants, mm -hmm. nectar, pollen, mm -hmm. they take that into them, but these chemicals add up in their bodies, mm -hmm. so then they die. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, uh, I think certainly a, a, grim, a grim future. There's other chemicals that they just spray it on crops, mm -hmm. but we live on an island. We don't have a separate set of air mm -hmm. for just agriculture. Right. We breathe the same air and we walk on the same soil. So those chemicals build up on the soil and it goes into our normal breathing air. Mm -hmm. So the bees also breathe the same air mm -hmm. we do. Sure, sure. We're, we're, uh, what is the Hawaiian saying? Heva'a, hemoku, hemoku, heva'a, right? The, the, island, the canoe is the island, the island is the canoe, right? Uh, yeah, we're all, we're all in this all in this together. And this is what these bees are sort of a good example of, right? It is that everything really is connected to everything else here. And you can see it very clearly on, on your island. So they're the indicator for me. Mm -hmm. So I know I take care of honeybees, mm -hmm. and this is kind of my menagerie. Mm -hmm. I'm also able to take care of these bees if I have enough time, money, and energy. Mm -hmm. I'm coming up with ways to, I know there isn't going to be anyone else who can solve this problem. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a team of one. <laughs> okay. And I realize and recognize there is this problem. Mm -hmm. Honeybees make money by selling honey. Mm -hmm. Solitary bees, to you personally, I'll ask you a question. How much do you pay for a coconut tree to be healthy? Right. Yeah. Right. You know, it's not a question you even think about, right? It's not a question, but I think about right. it greatly, right. knowing that at some point there could be a disease that affects coconut trees. Mm -hmm. I know and that uh, I'll start over. I believe honeybees communicate with the plants. Mm -hmm. And my scientific proof for that is, honeybees are able to read the stress of plants. Mm -hmm. That's how they know how to communicate with trees mm -hmm. on their own. That's also how they are able to alleviate plants' distress. They're able to find the problem and alleviate that. Mm -hmm. Usually it's pollination, uh -huh. but it's also blight mm -hmm. when there is an actual problem attacking, for, for example, a tree. Mm -hmm. We're having more and more of that. Okay. It's not global warming, mm -hmm. it is a man-made problem. Sure. We know it is the agrochemical companies mm -hmm. dumping pollution on our soil mm -hmm. and it's causing problems right right okay so that's uh, that's then a real a real issue for these bees um, what, what do you have a sense of the, the population of these bees, of these solitary bees? I mean, are, or how, how endangered are they? So we only, UH Manoa, discovered seven of these species about 10 years ago. Okay. Kind of like our happy face spider. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the happy face spider in nature? No. So how would I see the happy face spider that many people in elementary schools in Hawaii know about? It's by going to the Bishop Museum mm -hmm. and you can see it on a magnifying glass, mm -hmm. not in nature though. Okay. So the solitary bees, how do we see them? I don't want you to see them uh -huh. because they're solitary bees. Uh -huh, okay. They want to be left alone and do their work in order to keep our orchids sure. preserved. Well, cool. We're going to go into this in more depth when we come back, but right now we're going to take a little break. I've got Darren Olson here, a beekeeper uh, extraordinaire. Uh, and we're talking about Pricky, the, the solitary endemic Hawaiian bees. And I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Likeable Science. We'll be right back after a short break. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present ThinkTech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, where we bring together 
researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me one o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's research in Manila. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. And you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. I've got Darren Olson with me today in the Think Tech studio here. Darren is a beekeeper, uh, third, fourth, fifth generation beekeeper, whatever. Longer than that. Longer than that, okay. His ancestors for many generations have kept bees, and so he is a, a very deeply knowledgeable guy about bees. We've been talking about the particular the solitary endemic Hawaiian bees, uh, stingless, I guess, and uh, that are facing a sort of multiple threats are facing threats from particular kinds of insecticides and pesticides that are being used. They're facing threats presumably from just general agricultural chemicals. They're facing threats because of land use that's, that's broken up their habitat into smaller and smaller islands. They may be facing threats from things like climate change as temperatures go up. Uh, it could be facing all kinds of other threats. So, and we discussed earlier what happens if these bees disappear, and these bees, very few people see many, if any, of ever in their lives. Doesn't seem big, but the, a bunch of flowers will then also go extinct when the bees go extinct. So this is, uh, it, it's, it's important that they be preserved, and, and, and you say you are like the only person working on this issue. That I know of, <laughs> correct. So, uh, so how did you have, tell, say more about this, I mean, how did you get involved in this quest, and, and you know? Well, dumb luck. Okay. So on purpose, the um, way I'd like to put it for myself is, I'm trying. Mm -hmm. I approach some startups and some venture capitalists and some other accelerators and just talking. Mm -hmm. I'm a generational master beekeeper. I'm mm -hmm. trying to be humble here mm -hmm. on your show, but I, I want to explain who I am. Mm -hmm. This is my subject matter expertise. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult, for example, here in Hawaii to make a good sustainable living. Mm -hmm. So I've been working on different avenues. What is the most valuable product that can also be pono, mm -hmm. worthwhile and righteous here mm -hmm. in Hawaii to add value mm -hmm. to our sustainable economy here in Hawaii? Mm -hmm. So going out of my comfort zone, this mm -hmm. is where my journey began. Mm -hmm. While I'm talking, they ask questions like you are now. Mm -hmm. Aren't bees just the same thing? Aren't there right. just bees? Right. No. What do you care about personally? Mm -hmm. So I'm asking you personally, mm -hmm. do you like chocolate? Sure, a lot of chocolate. Do you want organic chocolate made here in Hawaii? Sounds super. Do you want that to be sustainable? Absolutely. So then you do need our endemic Hawaiian solitary bees because they do a better job of pollinating chocolate than honeybees in this one example. Okay. So if they all died, then we couldn't have chocolate mm -hmm. here commercially. Mm -hmm. Instead of 40 pods on a chocolate tree here in Hawaii, mm -hmm. if honeybees were the only solution to pollinate, then there'd be one pod wow. per tree. Okay. So that's not economically right. sustainable. Yeah, okay. So now, Asking a venture capitalist, right. is that a good enough reason to fund mm -hmm. saving the Hawaiian solitary bees? Mm -hmm. Their honest answer back to me from the return on investment standpoint, mm -hmm. they asked, couldn't we just import bees from South America, for example? Right. Legally, 
legally here in Hawaii, no, we're not supposed to bring right. over any invasive species. Sure, sure. So it's the law that you're not supposed to and it's illegal. Right. The answer from a venture capitalist can be, yeah, but we can change the law if it will save one sector of our economy. Hmm. So yes, except for the Hawaiian value of having an endemic mm -hmm. solitary bee that's now on the endangered species list, that once we lose that, we'll also lose orchids mm -hmm. that are endemic to Hawaii. So not only do we lose the chocolate value, mm -hmm. but now orchids yeah. and a species. Well, well, just general biodiversity laws. Yeah. They're not as sexy as pandas, right. Right. but it's what I know. Yeah. No, no, this is this is this is great stuff, and this is it's it's important work. You know, obviously, it's it's that's a, and that is a great example. And, and you would think you might be able to tie in with some of the folks who are doing the chocolate produ production and really you know get get them psyched into this. Where, where they want to help you preserve lands, protect sort of be res uh, reserves, as it were. You know. So that's part of my struggle. Mm -hmm. When I did approach farmers, for example example saying, so from the honeybee standpoint again, mm -hmm. UH Manoa knows that cucumbers, for example, have a higher value when honeybees are on the fields when it's time for cucumbers to flower. Mm -hmm. You have a better value cucumber crop. Mm -hmm. Explaining that to farmers, the immediate answer was no. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've now in my journey realized I need to go outside of my comfort zone, mm -hmm. communicate more, mm -hmm. and maybe have to work with chefs, for example, right. and then get them to buy into the chefs saying to the farmer, we want your produce to have a better shelf life mm -hmm. and a higher quality taste. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that is to have honeybees on that farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, so it makes sense. But it's, it's a very hard case then with these these solitary bees, which you can't really farm, right? You can't really raise hives of them because they're solitary bees. So do they have right. value? Right. I haven't found a monetary value mm -hmm. yet, so I have to go for the cultural value mm -hmm. or the biodiversity value. Mm -hmm. I don't have a solution. Right. No, it's, it's, it's uh, unfortunately, uh, I think a problem that a lot of, uh, it's become increasingly uh, common, right? There, there are very few pandas, right? They're so, so sort of cute and sexy that, you know, everyone loves them and will pay a lot of attention. Uh, and there are lots and lots of sort of less interesting, you know, less sexy, less cute uh, animals, plants that are equally endangered, but are not not going to get the, the attention, not going to get the, the big stars donating money in there to the cause. Yeah, um, and yeah, it's uh, the, that's that's very un unfortunate. But uh, presumably, some of the other folks at UH Manoa at least know of these issues, and and you have some at least intellectual support for for you there. You know, so they're giving us the research mm -hmm. that we need to be able to explain. Why is this insect important mm -hmm. when we work at it from a different standpoint as beekeepers? We know that they have value mm -hmm. and we don't go out of our way to destroy them, but here now is the beekeeper's explanation that our Hawaiian plants, which are, I see them being less and less visible mm -hmm. and seeing more and more plants that are non-valued, sure. meaning it's just a nondescript tree mm -hmm. that nobody eats or takes anything from versus a Hawaiian medicine plant mm -hmm. that we would normally see in Hawaii 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. If we value those plants, and, and I'm trying to go back to one of your questions, how can people help mm -hmm. Hawaii? Planting traditional Hawaiian plants is my 100% best answer okay. for that question. 
what could we do? Planned Hawaiian medicine plants, plant Hawaiian plants that are endemic mm -hmm. to Hawaii, planting our orchids. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, that's, that, that's, that's good concrete stuff that people, people can actually work with, right? It's, it's, it's clean, clean, clear, neat. It uh, gives people a, a job to do, and we'll, we'll do, do these bees a uh, world of good, presumably. You could, you could envision it, particularly if you mapped out more or less where the populations were, you could start connecting them with corridors where there are now Hawaiian plants that they would also pollinate and have, could connect remnant populations and allow them to keep going. You know, uh, clean up some areas, hopefully after some while the pesticides all gradually wash away, uh, at least drop to low, low levels, but not, not uh, that, that's, uh, that's amazing. So what, what uh, sort of shifting just for a moment here, of course, what, what background, I mean, you know, obviously from your generation that you had beekeeping in your blood, as it were, what sort of formal training did you have to go through, or was this really an apprenticeship that you basically learned at your grandparents' and parents' knees? So, as a seven-year-old, mm -hmm. having to help dad, and, and when I'm saying have to, it was spending time sure. with my dad, sure. which was fun. Mm -hmm. So we would, first we'd learn from extraction. Mm -hmm. Take When he took the honeybee hives off of the honey into our house, and we would extract the honey mm -hmm. from the frames. Mm -hmm. That was sure. basically first introduction yeah, okay. of hands-on learning yeah, there we go. to yeah. the extreme. Yeah. And it wasn't, and <laughs> you got over your fear of bees quickly, is go. what I'm trying to yeah. say, no, it's, 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 if, if that happened to you. Right, no, it sounds, sounds like you, you learned this long, learned it deep, and learned it firsthand. Yeah, that, that, that's great, that's, that's authentic learning that's very best. Well, this is, this is wonderful. This has been incredibly uh, instructive to me. Uh, I had no idea of the, the richness of the Hawaiian bee story. Uh, and it, it's from now on, people should know, right? When you, uh, bees are not just bees. There are lots of kinds of bees. They do lots of different things. So I very much appreciate your being here. I look forward to uh, your success in, in keeping these bees going. And uh, I wish you the best of luck with that. Great. Thank you very much, Dylan. Thank you. I'm Ethan Allen. You're here with me on Lifeable Science. Darren Olson has been with us today, and we'll be back next week. See you then.